Hello, welcome to PCAP's Native Prairie Speaker Series. My name is Caitlin Morose, and I am the Stewardship Coordinator with Saskatchewan Prairie Conservation Action Plan, or PCAP. Today, Andrew Didiak with Environment and Climate Change Canada will be giving an overview of the conservation status of the Northern Leopard Frog in Prairie Canada and an overview of recent assessments of the distribution of the Great Plains Toad in Saskatchewan and Manitoba. Just a little bit of housekeeping before we begin. PCAP's Native Prairie Speaker Series is a monthly presentation, either in the form of a webinar or an in-person talk in a Saskatchewan community on anything to do with Native Prairie conservation or species at risk. We will be hosting our next Native Prairie Speaker Series on Tuesday, November 24th. Dr. Nicola Copper from the University of Manitoba will be talking about the effects of oil development and anthropogenic noise on grass and songbirds in Canada. That's Tuesday, November 24th at 12 p.m. Central Time or 11 a.m. Mountain Time. You can register for upcoming webinars through the PCAP website. All past presentations can be found on the PCAP YouTube channel, and this webinar will be uplaid, uploaded there in the near future. I would like to take a moment to note that financial support for today's webinar is provided by our gold sponsors, Eco-Friendly Sask, Pemina Pipelines, Saskatchewan Cattlemen's Association, SaskTel, and Wildlife Habitat Canada. Our supporting sponsors are Camp Wolf Willow, Ranchers Stewardship Alliance, Inc., as well as Environment and Climate Change Canada. And a reminder to all of our listeners out there, if you have any questions during the presentation, please feel free to type it into the question section of the webinar dashboard at any time during the presentation. And questions will be answered at the end of the webinar. We have over 130 people um, on the webinar today, and everyone will be muted for the duration of the webinar. Now, a bit about today's presenter. Andy Didiak is a wildlife biologist with the Canadian Wildlife Services Species at Risk program, and he is based in Saskatoon. For the past 25 years, Andy has been conducting research and conservation programs with reptiles and amphibians in Alberta, Saskatchewan, and Manitoba. Some of these programs included demographic and movement studies of prairie rattlesnakes, bull snakes, and plains hognose snakes at Suffield National Wildlife Area, Alberta, eastern yellow-bellied racer movement studies at Boundary Pasture, Saskatchewan, smooth green snake life history and population estimates in southwest Manitoba, life history and population estimates of prairie skinks in southwest Manitoba, distribution studies of Great Plains toads, Canadian toads and Plains spadefoot toads in Alberta, Saskatchewan, and Manitoba, and delineating the southern range limit of wood frogs in Saskatchewan. He has prepared several recovery strategies and management plans for SARA reptile and amphibian species, has prepared COSWIC status reports and reviewed many status reports issued by COSWIC. So with that, I'm pleased to be able to turn it over to Andy. Mm -hmm. Good morning, all. I should do a sound check. Can everyone hear me, I think? Yes, loud and clear. Okay. Well, thanks for the invite for uh, uh, speaking to you today. I hope uh, everyone who's tuned in is doing well uh, with themselves and with their uh, families in this difficult time. Uh, today, I'm going to talk about leopard frogs and Great Plains toads in Saskatchewan. I'm going to spend a little more time on the Great Plains toads where I've had to uh, work directly in a variety of projects and I'll provide a, an overview of the Northern Leopard Frog based on some of my interactions with uh, colleagues preparing uh, management plans and what have you, conservation plans. So the Leopard Frog of course is a, a species of interest to us in, in uh, the Prairie Canada. Here's a image of a couple of the usual forms we usually see, the greenish form and the brownish form. It's listed as a special concern species under Kosiwik. There was, this is primarily because of the rapid decline to unknown causes, likely a disease event in the 70s, and actually in throughout North America with a 
disease front moving from east to west. We've got good, great uh, declines in leopard frogs in the prairie, prairie provinces. There's other risks that are considered uh, associated for the species in terms of you know, the usual habitat conversion problems in terms of ongoing wetland drainage. Game fish introduction, not as much of a concern these days in terms of it's not as big a program by provincial agencies. Collecting, that applies to uh, Manitoba, particularly where the First Nations have a long history of collecting uh, leopard frogs for the biological trade, education trade, and toxins, or localized toxin issues. It's the uh, leopard frog is the Western boreal population is a uh, leopard frog occurs throughout the southern portions of the three prairie provinces. Uh, occurrences and overall distribution in uh, the Athabasca Sand Plains, uh, Sand Plains area of Saskatchewan is really undetermined. And we have uh, some northern extensions of the uh, leopard frog north of Lake Athabasca and the Tazan Uplands uh, working up towards Great Slave Lake. Throughout the Saskatchewan, for example, we don't have a good idea of the overall distribution within the, the, the province. We have a persistent uh, incidental records throughout, uh, but we don't, there has not been a structured surveys to date. Given the situation, the species at risk uh, management plan was prepared for the northern leopard frog. There was some, some major objectives uh, six of them that were listed in this management plan. One of them is monitoring assessment of local populations and habitat. This has been uh, implemented to some degree in the province of Alberta where they've done some province-wide surveys and, the, and these may happen again. We don't have uh, provincial surveys in Saskatchewan or uh, Manitoba per se. Habitat conversation is an ongoing uh, activity by the various uh, and our uh, conservation uh, organizations. Stewardship, that's linked to the habitat conversation by stewardship organizations. Alberta has been doing some excellent work with working with uh, ranch, ranchers in, in, in designing and implementing uh, protection of breeding wetlands and wintering wetlands. Associated with both these conservation programs and stewardship, there's quite a bit of uh, outreach in, for the public by the different uh, NGOs. There's some research going on in terms of uh, some disease work in Alberta and a variety of uh, studies looking at uh, uh, breeding and wintering habitat characteristics. And there's been some reintroduction in Alberta. I don't believe that this is a, a current program now. And Waterton National Parks has been implementing some reintroduction. Uh, seeking egg masses from Saskatchewan actually as well. So the biggest thing we have to think about with the northern leopard frog when we want to talk about what makes them tick when they're in their, in their life history and how they, they're vulnerable is that they're, they have a three major types of seasonal habitats. They have a wintering habitat where they need, because they overwinter under the water surface so they need permanent water with appropriate water quality and oxygenation to spend the winter. In the spring, some of these wintering sites may actually have on their margin some spring re uh, reproduction, shallow marsh habitat as well. Otherwise, leopard frogs move varying distances from the wintering habitat to uh, shallow marshes at, at varying distances for reproduction. And from both of these habitats, they move uh, uh, variable distances, foraging and mesic grassland environments. So what we need is connectivity to allow this movement pattern amongst these three uh, components of, sea, of habitat. Permanent water bodies for the, the wintering are, it's kind of interesting. We think of the, the major lakes and reservoirs and uh, larger ponds where the water is deep enough that it's does not freeze to the bottom or does not freeze so close where there might be a loss of oxygen from chem, uh, biological oxygen demand. But there's a variety of other situations where they winter. The upper left photo shows of some uh, <coughs> groundwater seepage ponds along the escarpment of the South Saskatchewan River at Suffolk National Wildlife Area. 
leopard frogs are breeding and wintering in these ponds. There are also seepage fronts along the actual slope where water trickles out during the winter very in a laminar flow and leopard frogs can uh, go into these uh, very narrow uh, areas and overwinter with oxygenated water. This likely happens along the South Saskatchewan River elsewhere. And <clears throat> there's, a, you have to remember that rivers are not necessarily a good uh, place for them to overwinter, they do, but we have risks of predatory fish. And uh, there's also an issue of ice scouring and rafting and spring breakup that can <clears throat> cause mortality of the leopard frogs. Certainly along the South Saskatchewan River, where you have uh, Meand some meander bends and uh, near the base of the escarpment, sometimes uh, that provides a breeding habitat for leopard frogs and wintering habitat, depending on the depth if they're recharged during the, the June spring high flows. The breeding of the leopard frogs is really uh, focused on either shallow marshes or some more deeper permanent marshes where you have a structured uh, emergent vegetation along the shorelines. The surface water is, has to be retained until late summer to allow the metamorphosis of these tadpoles. And in more northern regions where development may be delayed due to overall colder temperatures, it's likely that tadpoles will overwinter and uh, transform in the following spring. Presence of predatory fish upon the tadpoles and water quality depending on, on the type of land use are, can be issues for successful reproduction. So just an overview of the reproduction of these northern leopard frogs, and this has some bearing in terms of how we do our surveys and, and our ability to detect them, and also to how to direct our stewardship. Northern leopard frogs form the male, males uh, calling choruses from late May to early June. They can call in the afternoon as well. Some other, most other amphibians call mainly after um, sunset or more strongly after sunset, but the leopard frog and the chorus frog and the Canadian toad can call in the afternoon, warm afternoons as well. One of the big things about uh, these calling courses is that the, the calls uh, are not very loud. They're very distinctive, that uh, groaning, uh, rubbing of balloons, uh, grunting type of call. You can all Google it if you haven't heard it before. It's quite distinctive and entertaining, but they are difficult to detect at a distance. So this is one species that is not as easy to survey from uh, road, for example, road survey stops because of the lower, relatively lower volume of the, of the call. The pairs form the amplexus and the movement of the male and female to egg laying sites quite often can be what could be called communal sites where the egg masses are attached to the uh, 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 vegetation structures emerging from the water. And the metamorphosis occurs in August, sometime in Southern Prairie, Canada, and as noted earlier, some may overwinter in more Northern sites. The foraging habitat is another very important component. There are a moist skin, thin skinned, uh, Amphibian species not as well adapted to arid conditions with their skin, their integuments. So they they, they need uh, a reasonable amount of uh, vegetation biomass to provide shading, to reduce moisture loss. They'll settle their body into the um, the, the ground litter and to reduce um, lo uh, uh, water loss. But important areas, particularly in our dry grasslands or along riparian areas where there's this a more moist uh, vegetation and cover. So what are the populations doing? In this last Kosevic uh, assessment, this indicates the, the relative, uh, the, the distribution of occurrences reported in the Prairie provinces, more historical ones versus more recent ones. Very difficult to come up with a, a big picture because a lot of the older records that were in areas uh, that have never really been revisited. There are more remote areas, or so it's difficult to get an overall assessment. What we know from many other small local sites that leopard frogs had declined from the 70s. This is a picture too in Alberta. This picture from the 
uh, report from Alberta indicates that the, the big thing in Alberta is that overall distribution is reduced and they tend to be more, very localized now and much more isolated, much more fragmented, which can be an issue for, from a metapopulation consideration in terms of a rescue effect after a local extinction. So Alberta has had its prevent, these provincial-wide surveys. They've had some reintroductory efforts. They have ongoing stewardship projects. Saskatchewan does not have a provincial survey. I've had some initial discussions with the province of Saskatchewan and nature of Saskatchewan that it, it's probably time to engage in this. So many of the listeners may be called upon to participate at some time in the near future. The Saskatchewan does record, it's a species of interest and recorded in the Conservation Data Centre. And of course, there are ongoing uh, here and there stewardship projects by our uh, conservation organizations. Manitoba does not have a provincial survey. It also records uh, species, the species for the CBC. I, uh, interesting enough, these First Nations harvest, they have biological collection data that does provide some trend information. And it appears that Manitoba, overall a little more music uh, climate in southwest, southern Saskatchewan, Leopard frogs seem to be persisting and in fairly abundant numbers, and appears to be the same case, but more localized in Saskatchewan. We've talked about the three types of uh, seasonal habitat for the northern leopard frog. All of these habitats need to be maintained and we have to maintain its connectivity. What are the risks to, to these environments and to uh, their connectivity? One of the biggest, of course, is ongoing wetland drainage, off-farm drainage. Uh, this is a concern in terms of uh, particularly uh, for the, those wetlands that might be a little more prone, but are reduced in permanency and are not allowed for wintering. Grazing regimes, overgrazing can be an issue, but in many cases, uh, the uh, grazing regimes can be easily accommodated. There are all kinds of opportunities for producers to uh, work with uh, conservation organizations and it, does, and it is ongoing in terms of uh, addressing stocking rates in immediate vicinity of uh, wintering habitats or bringing wetlands through fencing or, uh, or off-site off, off watering and uh, salt block placement are usual conservation approaches that can be effective. Uh, even if fencing is incorporated in a portion of an important um, uh, riparian area, the, there's all kinds of opportunities for uh, some grazing into those areas. They don't have to be just excluded. So there's all kinds of opportunities and they've been demonstrated in the province of Alberta. Uh, Chris Kendall of the Alberta Conservation Association and uh, Dave Prescott from the province of uh, Alberta would be excellent contacts for if you would want to get more information on that. Okay, on to the Great Plains toads. Now look at that, look at that toad. How could you not love that toad? very phlegmatic. This is a species of particular interest to me. This species is listed as special concern. It was looked at in 2010 and, it, and 10 years earlier. It's, uh, we'll see in a moment, the team seems to be widespread, but apparently uh, small numbers, but it's just a lot of uncertainty and just of its uh, distribution in the prairie provinces and the grasslands of uh, Alberta and Saskatchewan, and Manitoba, and other, and its ongoing threats, particularly from wetland gen, uh, the usual um, loss of wetland breeding habitat in particular. Before I go on talking about the Great Plains, so maybe I'll just give a little bit of primer because this is an important thing when we receive. Uh, reports of Great Plains toads or Canadians, it's just hard to tell the difference. Many of you listening probably know very well the differences, but I'll just briefly go over this. The Great Plains toad on the far left is a fairly chunky toad, up to 100 millimeters, you know, snout to, uh, body length. It tends to be a little bit smaller and more streamlined. Uh, the Canadian toad is a little more smaller and streamlined. In the center top, you can see a dorsal view the Great Plains toad tends to have some very larger dark spots near the, the midline of the, of the back. And these tend to be bordered with a light uh, fringe. Whereas the Canadian toad on the left, you can see the differences. They tend to have a smaller, on the dorsum, these smaller spots, they seem to be much more thinner. I call them reverse, 
for example, the two large ones reversed the apostrophes. The Great Plains toads, uh, these spots have more and more oranges, lighter oranges uh, tubercles, whereas they're more fewer in number and larger and they're rusty in the, in the Canadian toad. On the far right top, the Canadian toad tends to have some black speckling on its belly. This is a little extreme case, but they're scattered small black spots where most great plain toads have a clear beige uh, underside. And on the bottom right, so some of the head features that are distinctive on the left, there's a raised boss with a groove between the, uh, the eyes on the top of the head in the Canadian toad. In the great plains toad, there's a raised, uh, uh, anterior raised boss, but it quickly diverges and then goes to at right angles behind the eye in an L-shaped form. And there's usually a, a, a little bit larger parotid gland on the side behind uh, that tends to be very close uh, in close contact or very close to this uh, post-orbital ridge. And unfortunately, I can't get these uh, calls, so we have to Google them yourself. But the Canadian toad and, and the Great Plains toads have distinctive calls. The Canadian toad has a very rapid, rapid trill, squalling type of sound. It's, a, um, its vocal sac is rounded. The Great Plain toad has a very distinctive, harsh, clattering jackhammer type call, very distinctive, and it go, can go for a very long, for many seconds. It's amazing how long the call can go. And they have this distinctive sausage shaped uh, vocal sac that uh, projects beyond the snout. Tadpoles or late stage tadpoles of the Canadian toads are overall very dark with some ear gold iridescence throughout the ventral and dorsal part of the body. Great Plains toads, uh, toad uh, tadpoles are more brassy, goldish in color. The tail musculature has is goldish with black patches, quite often a, a somewhat brassy color on the on the ventral portion. So pretty distinctive once you you know what you're looking for. And of course, this is what we need for some of our work. Again, we'll talk about the reproduction of the Great Plains toad and how it bears upon how we're able to find these when we're interested in looking if they're in a particular area or assessing distribution. When do they call? If it depends on where you are. I've had them calling in the second week of May at Suffield. And same thing in uh, around the Great Sand Hills of Saskatchewan in the latter part of May in Southeast Saskatchewan. But probably the core calling period from year to year is if you were going to design a survey, it would be the last week of May and the first two weeks of June. They use these shallow seasonal wetlands. On the left, you see there a uh, natural wetland on the edge of a pasture, of course, emergence. But when you have heavy storm events or heavy uh, flooding events in cultivated fields, can get have sh those depressions can fill with water. And with the seed bank in the next year, or even late in that, given that growing season, you start getting growth of, of different uh, vegetation, including cattails. And which, and this is an important consideration because you, uh, Great Plains toads and Canadian toads and chorus frogs and what have you, they're reluctant to call when you have a wetland recession where you have a lot of exposed substrate and no, uh, no uh, protruding of vegetation. That's in contrast to, for example, the plain spadefoot, which is quite happy to lay out in the middle of a bare, large expanse of open water and a call during their choruses. So wetland recession, when the, you may have water in the wetland, but it doesn't mean that it's a, a, a conducive for the development and continuation of a breeding course. The, uh, the pairs, uh, it's an interesting uh, mating system that you have males calling, adult males and females come to attend and approach the males, but you also have juvenile uh, Great Plains toads. They may not be, they may be sexually mature, but they're not as, um, they're subdominant to the older um, uh, Great Plains toads. So they don't call, but they're there. And then what they'll do is they'll intercept the female, which is a, approaching a, a calling male. And so they, to some extent, they do participate in the reproduction of that year. The um, tadpoles are grow quite rapidly, and for the most part, the average metamorphosis is completed in these seasonal wetlands by mid-June. So during these um, 
reproduction of late plains toads, one of the most effective ways is to do calling surveys because they, they tend to have a very defined calling period. It seems like they'll call for many days in a row. We're looking at acoustic recording data to, to confirm this, but from our field data, it suggests that there's a regionally and locally, there's a, a large breeding uh, effort going underway and they're calling night after night as females come and go. And um, that you can, the other alternative is to do dip netting to try and confirm, a, to detect uh, tadpoles. This is more labor intensive, of course, and, uh, but it can supplement uh, calling surveys. Wintering of Great Plains toads. I can't say too much about that. We, they're, like other toads, they're, um, they're not freeze intolerant. So they have to get down below the frost line. We have lots of information of, of Canadian toads that say in Minnesota, what have you, are showing how they're, they're actually, they're strong homing to wintering sites. They're getting to loose, unconsolidated soil. Some features are called Nima mounds, which might be related to um, burring and a, a loosening of soil by pocket gopher activity. We have no information on where our, our Great Plains toads are wintering. I wouldn't be surprised if they're actually doing one or two things, using going down burrows of some pocket gopher burrows or other spurring mammals or burrowing down within the, the, the disturbed or looser soil associated with these structures. There's a good study for a graduate student. On occasion, I get a call from students wondering if they wanted to conduct a research project, a master's project, for example, on Great Plains toads. Lots of interesting questions regarding their reproduction, particularly their movements and wintering. Uh, but it's always a challenge with a species that you know, may suddenly, may suddenly, the student may be ready to go, but there's not a breeding effort that year. So it's always a, a difficult uh, thing to consider for a graduate program. So where are, where are these Great Plains to toads in Prairie Canada? The status report I have on the screen here showed the uh, records that were available, available at that time. If we look at Alberta, there's a large concentration near the Saskatchewan border, which is associated with Suffolk National Wildlife Area and adjacent areas of the military base. This, uh, ref this, uh, uh, this reflects some of my work in the, in the 90s and early 2001 or two, visiting all the wetlands and portions of this area. But there's also a lot of incidental records from the kangaroo rat researchers who drive every night and see these on the road. So that's somewhat of an artifact, but it's uh, there's certainly there's distributed throughout there. Then there's a gap to the west of that, which is probably the base, the balance of the CFB Suffield large base and some other large pasture areas where there's been limited survey effort. And then we get into the more, what appears to be the more Western edge of its range in Alberta, which is uh, in the irrigation district from the rolling hills of Purple Springs down to Northeast of Brooks, Alberta. And then you have a third area down in the extreme Southwest of Alberta in the <coughs> Lost River, Sage Creek environments, uh, grasslands. In between, we have the Cypress Hills upland, which they're unlikely to occur. But I suspect that with more survey effort, you, you would have an entire lobe of distribution in that, uh, in that area of Alberta, with the exception of the Cypress Hill upland. You go to the other side of the Prairie Canada to Manitoba, a little different situation here. This species was first detected by our good friend, Buzz uh, old Bill Preston in extreme Southwest Manitoba in the Lyleton area. And he and his colleagues managed to get a few more records over the next few years, but it was a very small area uh, up to Grand Clare, the most northern one. So certainly there's a lobe of some sort at that point in time we were aware of that they were in Manitoba. Saskatchewan is a much less clear uh, indication. In the west of Saskatchewan, there's, there was a few records available. Francis Cook and Fred Schuler back in the 60s finding Great Plains toads and Canadian toads calling near Piapot. Lawrence Townley Smith's records in northern northern end of great, uh, the Great Sand Hills and near, near Big Stick Lake record from PFRA staff. There was a few records, one down by Rock Glen near the U.S. border, one near Glen Ewan, uh, uh, part, uh, Glen Ewan and uh, near Coalfields Pasture. They may be, the, the Great Plains toad does approach the U.S. border. 20 to 30 kilometers sometimes 
uh, but uh, so they may uh, come across the border. I conduct tried to conduct some surveys on the on the PFRA pastures back in 2011, but it was just too wet with those gumbo soils. We couldn't get in, so we did a a road survey along the U.S. border within one or two miles from the East Block of Grasslands Park right to Manitoba. That was a year very, as I recall, very huge uh, flooding in that area. We didn't get any Great Plains toes till we just uh, shortly before we got to the Manitoba border, so we knew that they were there. I'll just note that there's a few uh, circled records. I'm not sure how they got into that status report. Unlikely, there's one by Lake Beaver Baker that was turned out to be a great Canadian toad from some of Canada's new fields work. Showed the vegetation work was found. There's one near Mortlach, possibly, but and the other two east of Regina, unlikely, but you get surprised, we'll see. So that's where the situation was in 2011 or 2010. And that I, I was interested based on that this uh, very uncertainty in Saskatchewan was unacceptable. And that's what leads us to the SARA management plan that was created. And one of the manager objectives was to better determine the distribution of the species, especially in Saskatchewan, given the situation. And so that today, I'm just gonna talk about some of our efforts with that regard in terms of trying to get a better idea of the distribution of the Great Plains toads. You can't understand how, how much it's at risk and how you can't apply stewardship if you don't know where they are. So we selected two areas that we're going to look at in the vicinity of the Great Sand Hills, where some of those there's some of those existing records uh, for three years, and a little bit of work in 13, 14, and then we moved over to extreme southeast Saskatchewan and southwest Manitoba for three years, and a little bit of work in 13, 15, and a little bit of work in 16 and 18. The first thing we did in the, the Great Sand Hills area was to do larval surveys. Now, the reason we started this is because it is a means of, of detecting uh, the species. As you recall, in 2010, there was a huge torrential downpour. The Trans-Canada Highway near Maple Creek was breached. And in, in effect, there was a huge amount of water across the landscape. We didn't do calling surveys. The province of the Saskatchewan sent a few people out and they did confirmed a, a large breeding effort of Canadian toads and Great Plains toads and spadefoots going on in the Burstall, Leventhal, Maple Creek areas. So in the first two weeks of July, we conducted surveys. We had several staff, they each had each day had a two township area to try and find 10 or 15 wetlands near their within and near their road right of ways. And at this time, in the last two weeks of July, we're, we're sampling late, st late stage larvae. A whole uh, type, a variety of uh, wetland types in grasslands and dugouts or depressional areas, drainage channels, some more permanent wetlands, roadside ditches. So it's quite a variety. But you have to remember that there was also a very large amount of uh, shallow water on the crop and the, and the fields and in the flooded pastures because of this. So there was a, 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 an immense number of potential breeding sites. So we did a variety, uh, we did dip netting as our, our means of um, trying to see if uh, there, because our focus was on uh, presence, was a, was a species or their uh, larvae of great balloon toads breeding in that particular spot. Certainly um, there was ongoing um, other years of uh, huge storm events. It's that ominous cloud near McLaren Lake Regional Park, northwest of Maple Creek. One of my summer students took that photo and is understandably a little bit concerned. We also uh, maintained some um, hygiene in terms of cleaning all our gear and our waders. You can see a picture of me standing in a garbage can with a bleach solution, scrubbing the waders, and we'd have to scrub all the equipment and nets, kind of hard on the nets. And, equipment, but you have to keep the bar high for disease transmission. And some, this just shows that sometimes you can actually see the uh, different tadpoles of different species and near the, near the edge of the shore when it's clear. In other cases, it's more turbid. There's myself showing the, the technique of depth netting. And it's um, interesting that uh, 
you never know what you're going to get in some of these situations where they're serving some of the ponds of mixed uh, multiple number of species involved. And of course, as you'd expect in some of these years, the high evapotranspiration rates and some of these shallow ponds to start with, things get pretty grim for some of these tadpoles as the water disappears. Do a little bit of rescue effect here, but uh, certainly in, this is a common occurrence in some years. Some ponds are, you get recruitment, some you don't. So we did the usual biology. We put in uh, a defined number of, of, of net sweeps and bring them back in a pail and sort them when we take our pictures and aging and measuring and what have you and and uh, to confirm what species were present there. This is Jared Kylo, one of my students, busily processing. We'll give a little, a little overview again about these um, the larvae, which we use to different, different, determine what species are there. On the left, the Great Plains toad has the distinctive uh, brassy color with black and black and gold on the dorsal musculature, somewhat coppery on the, on, the, on the ventral. And on the dorsal, it's not clear on this slide, but quite often you can see the large spots with multiple little orange tubercles on it already. And lateral, and they have dorsal eyes. Canadian toad, again, much different, very dark, very black, some iridescence and dorsal eyes. Other species will encounter the spade foot toad. Interesting enough, of course, their appearance is different depending on the clarity of the water. These two individuals show what they look like in, in, in clear water on the dorsum. It's very interesting when they're near the surface. It just appears quickly, but you see three radiating orangish lines, very distinct when you're looking down on the water. And you get into turbid water, a very washed out beige, uh, different type of uh, pigmentation uh, presentation in turbid water. So you get in the chorus frogs, distinctive, very globular bottle, bo uh, body. Eyes are lateral, not dorsal and the insertion of the, of the dorsal fin a little bit higher up in the back. Well, quite often you see very clearly the coil of the intestines. This is not 100% and we see that occasion in other species, but it seemed to be a somewhat frequent uh, character. Northern leopard frogs, the big jumbos, pretty distinctive, torpedo shaped. Not as many, of course, as you expect. These, they are much more localized. And tiger salamanders at different age stages. So. You, get, you never know what you're going to capture in some of these ponds. And one, and here's an example of just beautiful appearance of some of these late stage or men, metamorphosizing tadpoles. You can see the Great Plains toad. There's those larger spots, bunch of little multiple orange dots, the tubercles. Here's a plain spade foot, much more smooth. Don't have those large, large um, spots, but do have a, a sort of tubercles of orange and darkness, and we have some of the striping already developed of the chorus frog. On occasion, you get a cannibalistic plain spade foot. Quite distinctive, you see uh, they, in the high density areas or when uh, water's, um, water levels uh, is, is getting uh, very low and getting concentration of tadpoles, this uh, phenomenon can occur. You get a very enlarged musculature and in, in the jaws. You see both lateral, dorsal, and ventral views. Very distinctive. Here's one in the net. Even though it's in the net, he's busy going after and doing his business with a smaller one. Aren't you glad they're that small? So that was the larval survey effort. Then we did 2011 and 12. We started doing night calling surveys. We started to happen after sunset. There are some exceptions, but we usually they seem to call later than other species, about a half an hour after civil, after sunset. Um, this is not the case in some cases where there's been storm events uh, and early in the spring, particularly after having bred for a while, we, it seems that they will actually start calling in after a heavy rain event in the afternoon. We had some predetermined survey stops in 2011 all along the periphery of the sand hills. And in 2012, we looked at farmland habitat east and west of the sand hills. Use the three minute listing period. Well, in the recording, what direction there was a calling course of amphibian, whether it's great pintones or not, in the standard course level estimated number, which is a tough thing to do. 
and an estimation of the volume of the calls and direction. This is an example of how we were assigning London Proof in the Sand Hills different survey stops and some of our data sheets just recording the uh, what species were recorded. At a given stop, you might have one, two, or three observations. In other words, breeding uh, calling courses of one or two or one a species. And of course, it's, I guess I can't help but saying, as we all know, it's a beautiful thing to be out in the evenings on these calm evenings. You have all the different marsh birds calling the snipe and the saw rail and the coots and the marsh wrens and bitterns. It's, it was a, it's actually a very pleasant uh, way to spend some evenings. We saw a lot of nice country, but uh, it, was, it was a really very pleasurable experience, though tiring. Well, here's an example. As I talked earlier on spadefoot toads quite often when these large uh, breeding efforts occur, spadefoots can, are also very abundant. You should Google that one too, as far as it's called, it's pretty distinctive. When you have one, it's just a simple call. When you get two, they start doing a, a duet up and down, up and down. When you get a large number of them, of course, calling, then it's sort of like a rolling up and down, a murmuring from a distance, it's very distinctive versus the harsher calls of the Great Plains toad or the Canadian toad. So just to see where we did all our sampling, and get some of the uh, distribution data here. The, the green dots, I don't know how well you can see that on your screen, but this shows we're all, all our, in 2010, 11, and 12, the wetlands that we sampled, over 800 wetlands. Definitely there. <clears throat> they were, um, we sampled mainly west of the end of the uh, sand hills in 2010, sampled to the east, and then 2012 we did some infill of different areas. Quite a few wetlands throughout this broad area, South Saskatchewan, to approach the um, swept current. Oh, I'll have to say we didn't go into the Great Sand Hills. Where there's access issues. I suspect that there's a, a variety of falling in there. A lot of those sand plains in I don't have a rising Can you? I need. I need to um, have the moderator confirm. The Hi, this is Caitlin here. I'm. Um, I'm just having a little bit of trouble hearing you. Can you hear me? Okay. It's. I got a message. My audio connection has been lost. Attempting to reconnect now. I don't know if our guests can hear me. Um, yes, I, I can hear you loud now. I thought it was just my end, but a couple people wrote um, wrote in that we, we were having some technical difficulties there, but um, do you want to continue on? I think it's back. Okay, uh, maybe I'll go back a couple of slides because it just happened. To, okay. Can yeah, people just, indicate if they've seen this slide? Any comments? Um, Sure, if you want to go back one slide, that would be great. I can hear you loud and clear now. Okay, all right. So I'll start again. So we sit over the three years, we sampled over 800 wetlands for larval sampling, quite, quite widely distributed from uh, the Swift Current area south of the South Saskatchewan River to the, Cypress, the foot of the Cypress Hills and Skull Creek area. Uh, We didn't do the interior of uh, the sand, uh, great sand hills. They can, I'm sure there's breeding uh, situations throughout those sand plains, but uh, their access was difficult. And that's, we can assume that there is some distribution of the great plains toads and spadefoots, for example, in that area, but um, we haven't gone in there directly. Our calling surveys for the two years of 11 and 12, 11, we were focusing on looking on the, on the periphery of the sand hills, a lot of uh, sampling. Trying to look at the potential uh, occurrences on native grassland versus our uh, cropland. 
And then the next year we expanded and did a lot of uh, our some calling um, efforts in more distance areas in the uh, periphery of this area and in the cropland areas. So there was about uh, for over 1,400 survey stops, but uh, we had we decided to repeat some of the stops in 2011 because of it. some of the earlier surveys. It was a little bit cool in mid-May, and so we repeated those surveys later in the beginning of June. So about 1,260 stops were involved. And so this combines us our calling and our our larval survey. So we have quite a quite pretty good coverage throughout that whole area around the sand hills. So what do we find in the larval surveys? Now we we detected 61 Great Plains toads throughout, which really are reflecting approximately our density of sampling. We did a lot more sampling near the sand hills. Remember, we sampled about 800 something whatever uh, wetlands. Well, you could. Get, when you have that much water, there was an immense amount of water on, on the um, landscape. And we have to remember that these are social aggregations, the calling courses, so they can't be anywhere. They're not scattered and delivered. They're concentrated calling and then the subsequent egg laying in, in particular wetlands. But we did manage to add quite a few records of the Great Plains toad compared to where we were before we started from these larval surveys. Then we add the calling surveys. We got another 69 records from the calling surveys. Again, a few more along because we have higher density, a few more around the periphery, but we are getting them throughout these cropland areas. Interestingly enough, it seems like this lobe stops along the eastward here. This is another area of sandy soils, a little bit a higher elevation though. Great Plains toads and spadefoots calling like crazy in here, but no Great Plains toads. Uh, Canadian toads and spadefoots, but no Great Plains toads. There may be some extension along this, this area here along the South Saskatchewan River. Ray Poulin from the Royal Saskatchewan Museum did a bio blitz near um, this area here. And they, there was a report, I believe, of a Great Plains toads. I haven't got the details of that, but uh, it's, at this time from our calling efforts, from our efforts with the larval and calling surveys combined, we've got, we don't have three or four records anymore. We have 130 and we got at least an approximation of where this lobe currently where they appear to be. More work to be done. This area here seems vacant, but it's an extremely, it's, it almost seems like some Lacrustian uh, areas of flat, hardly any wetlands in this area are highly cultivated. So that might explain why, we, even though we did some sampling in there. So definitely a lobe coming in from Alberta, connecting with the populations that we know exist in Alberta, bounded by the Cypress Hill uplands, and uncertain of what's going on here in terms of what the current limitation is. Oh, this shows in the yellowish shoes. Here's our the more sandy soils, and certainly, um, certainly they're in the sandy areas, but they're not a, a sand uh, sand dependent species. They're in other soil types. We know from the literature in different places in the Great Plains that they're in uh, alluvial soils and river valleys and a variety of soil types. So uh, they're not strongly linked to um, sandy soils. And we'll see that later on when we look at the Manitoba situation. Just want to show one other aspect because we said we 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 did we did some sampling in, in, in this area here in the cropland area, but in, I was just show an example of how conditions can really affect your ability to get an idea of how abundant they are spatially in a given area. In 2013, there's a yellow line here. In 2013, we were doing some shrike work at the end of June, or first few days of July, but we all decided to do some wetland sapping. It had been a dry spring, a lot of dry, all the ditches were dry, a lot of dry ponds, but we were doing some sampling. I came back one day after doing some shrike surveys and my summer students said, Andy, you wouldn't believe it. I had sent her some ponds that day to just to dip net to see if there had been any, what kind of breeding activity had occurred. And I guess that late afternoon, after that terrific storm, I showed that cloud earlier, there was a huge chorus frog and plain spade foot breeding effort going on at a pond right out here. So I said, and this was after dark, no, I had come back. So I said to her, do you want to go for a ride? <laughs> and so we started doing a, a road transit from this area almost up to the Alberta all night long. And, 
it's north of uh, Fox Valley a little bit. And this is the Trode we went along. It's about, the one we went about 32 kilometers. And some of these you can't see, these are polygons of probability of where they're occurring. We have a technique using volume and direction and a, and a arc map script that my Jeffrey Harder has put together for me. But there's a little smaller, you can't probably see some of the little smaller polygons because they're very close to the road. But just as you go every kilometer, one side or the other side. And this is an inherent, you know, that there's a, a huge amount of uh, calling sites after this major storm and uh, breeding effort, late breeding effort. The other amazing thing is this is what it looks like. Here's a little bit of a raised area here. It's extremely tense agricultural cropland, lots of canola. You have road right of ways and you have uh, scattered wetlands, some with grassy margins, some without very residual and so but when you look at this there's we seem to be persisting in a fairly high abundance now we can say well how often is that only something unique just by chance along this transit and this part of the uh, of the uh, area between the sand hills and alberta but certainly uh, in 2014 we had a similar episode and the same kind of thing so i what i'm getting at here is and we'll see when we look at the Manitoba data. Under optimal conditions, they might be extremely widely regularly distributed throughout this whole area. Okay, so then we'll go to Manitoba. We're almost done here. We'll go into another. After we had worked on this Sand Hills area, we decided let's see what's going on in southeast Saskatchewan, southwest Manitoba. I already mentioned some of these earlier records by Bill Preston and cooperators in, in the province of Saskatchewan. So we knew that they were in this area here. We had records near the Coalfields Community Pasture, or Glen Ewan, pardon me, Glen Ewan. 2011, I went along at that Montana border, US border survey, and we got them right near the corner. So we decided to go in and do the same thing. Well, before we did that, in 2011, when I was doing that border survey, Chris Friesen and Colin Murray from the province of Manitoba did some road surveys and these indeed showed that there are some more records in this area all the way up approaching Deloraine. You know, uh, these, or, these are quarters that where they detected calling and these green segment roads on this showed where they saw Canadian uh, Great Plains toads on the roads while they were driving these surveys. So it's definitely a little more expanded uh, lobe in that area. So we went in there in 2013, we established some two township grids. Uh, and uh, 2013, we were working in this area here. In 2014, we extended it all the way on, up to the Coalfields Community Pasture along the sur service approaching Estevan. And then, to, uh, to, but we also, um, we did this area here from 2013. And two, uh, 14, 15, again, here we, we, we were doing 2014 again, our core area, and uh, but we expanded greatly into Manitoba all the way to Deloraine and the Turtle Mountains. This was a little bit more intensive effort compared to the Sand Hills because we had, uh, were able to get a marshal, a variety of field assistance for, uh, uh, during the breeding season. And we decided to, wherever we could, establish a dense grid every mile. Every mile intersection, we had a calling station. And of course, the, the uh, calling calls of Great Plain Toads in some circumstances, you can hear them from two, kilo, two kilometers away, a mile and a quarter. So given that uh, they're very uh, uh, detected and are only um, 15, 1,600 meters apart, I mean, the chances are we're, with their calling, we're going to detect them. So it was quite a, a dense network that we decided to apply to this area. And this was throughout that whole uh, area from Estevan to uh, near Estevan to Delray, Manitoba. In order to do this, so uh, you have to invest time in the afternoon to make sure that the where, where you want to get to in the evening is possible. So of course, there was a lot of scouting, checking out our routes and where we're going to do our calling stations and creeping along some shallow water to see if it's got a hard bottom just to, so we can decide that when we get there at night, we can get through. Of course, when you get there at night, something you still have second thoughts. 
but anyway, that was a very effective way to um, to uh, um, ensure that our survey effort was uh, not uh, complicated by getting stuck or, or not being, having to, to alter the route or what have you. And during the afternoon, we also made notes in terms of the general habitat adjacent to the roads in terms of cropland, hayland, et cetera. So in 2013, we did about 471 stops in this first Southeast Saskatchewan, uh, Manitoba, right to the Alberta border. Well, there's a thousand observations. Now, as you remember, at a stop, you can have one or more observations, one or more amphibian breeding courses of one or each with one or more species. But there's 470 stops, pretty well, pretty well covered that whole grid, not too many gaps in it in terms of very large. 2014, we redid that area, but we also covered some adjacent area in Manitoba to hook up with those surveys of the province of Manitoba in 2011, and we went along to towards Estevan. And again, we had another 1,100 or so survey stops in that area. And then in 2015, we repeated a portion of that area from the previous two years, but we in here, but we greatly expanded. And so we got pretty uh, good coverage. Some of these areas are alluvial flats, a limited access associated with the source river, what have you. And, uh, but for the most part, we had some pretty good coverage. I should also mention that both in the Great Sand Hill surveys and in the Southeast Manitoba, uh, Southwest Manitoba and Southeast Saskatchewan, we are extremely fortunate that we had major breeding efforts and also the weather for almost the most part was um, excellent. You know, we didn't have any problems and we didn't do surveys if there were strong winds, but it was warm and uh, low winds. It was, we were very fortunate by chance to have excellent survey conditions. So here's it, uh, here it is all combined. So we met, so covering that Southeast Saskatchewan, Southwest Manitoba, a pretty nice grid of mainly mild space dust stops. 2013, that first lobe, we got a lobe of uh, around Carryvale and, and Gainsborough down to the US border detections. The next year we redid that area, essentially confirmed that lobe. We didn't get any detections farther. Now, these surveys were at the latter end of the um, survey period by the middle of June. I would think this should be repeated because by chance the calling period may just have stopped by the time we started heading east or west. So, but at this, with our survey effort and timing, we did not get records here, but I think it warrants a, a revisit. In 2015, we redid that area again, the same kind of coverage, same extent, but then we got a, quite a good coverage to understand that they're going all the way up south of Grand Claire, Manitoba here, towards Deloraine into the to the east of the uh, Turtle Mountains. And there's quite a regular distribution, so they're regularly distributed through that area. Then we have a distinct lobe. Some of those areas where we didn't have surveys that um, couldn't get into, maybe there might have been some, and we didn't have access for one reason or another to get into these areas, but quite a regular distribution, a distinct lobe. We know they're to the South and North Dakota. Uh, some some distance though we don't have any uh, survey effort and records that really show this uh, a direct connection here, but we can assume that that's that's the case. Again, sandy soils in here they're not really associated with are linked strongly with uh, the sandier soils. They're in a variety of soil types. So. After you look at, uh, we, so I guess after these uh, two efforts over these years, I think we have a pretty much better idea of where the Great Plains toad occurs in Southwest Manitoba, and Southeast Saskatchewan, and in the so Great Sandals here uh, area connecting to the uh, Alberta populations, which arc up from the Montana border. One thing we should note is the, uh, the south of the divide area, south of the French and River, the Milk River drainage is in Southern Saskatchewan. We haven't done much work in that area. We don't have any incidental records of toads at all. We have, I know I've had records, I've got records of chorus frogs, we have leopard frogs in Battle Creek and whatnot. One of the factors that might be going on in that south of the divide area is um, south of the French River to the US border is these what, uh, a lot of solanetic soils. There are heavy clayey soils. There's easy uh, repeated cultivation causes a, uh, 
a dense layer, subsurface layer, but that might perhaps, given an animal that has to uh, burrow below the frost line, I wonder if those heavy silicic soils and make that a toad-free zone. Time will tell when we get a chance to go in there and see what, what might be in there. This was a typical government operation. Look at all those trucks, but that's what it takes to get this kind of geographic scope. I was very, I was very fortunate to be able to get a lot of people to sign on. This kind of work is on a defined period during the breeding season. There's a small number of species. There are distinctive calls that people are can easily uh, be trained and they learn the calls and then we train for the first night or two. So in, in for the whole routine, so it, it's a very, it's a very, I was very fortunate to be able to get the, the uh, variety of uh, fun people to come out and help me do this work. And of course, that's what it's all about for all of us, right? It's a, the social side of it. So we had a lot of uh, great people uh, working afternoons and evenings and having brunch late brunch uh, for many days in the field. So I thank all of them and I thank my family for letting me go and play. Oh, I'm just gonna make a little blurb here before I'm done. Over the last 40 years, I've been collecting reptile and amphibian information and records in Saskatchewan and I'm in discussions with Nature Saskatchewan. I hope they won't take offense. I put their name on here, but we're preparing a, a reptiles and amphibians field guide for Saskatchewan. I'll soon be putting out a call for supplementing the, the many number of images, photographs I have of reptile amphibians. If you have something you think uh, that either is a really great depiction of a reptile amphibian that might, might want to consider or, or a unique uh, behavior pattern, it would be great to see that. And uh, it'll be duly acknowledged. And um, we'll also be uh, coming a call out to uh, supplement our very large number of records we have uh, for any observation uh, or uh, occurrences, the locations that you might be willing to offer. You can reach me at andrew.didiak at canada.ca. Thanks for the invite. Thank you. Thanks so much for the detailed and fascinating presentation. Um, we have a couple questions from some of our listeners. Um, a listener named Rob would like to know, um, are leopard frogs able to distinguish between wintering sites and shallow breeding sites? Or is it a matter of chance that the water doesn't freeze to the bottom? That's an interesting question, Rob, in terms of how does a frog think? Um, I guess average evolutionary consequences, uh, I don't know how they would actually select a, um, a breeding pond. We have to remember that there's two types of um, associations of amphibians to a wetland, or in this case, a wintering, uh, um, uh, a wintering site. There's a migration, which involves homing, which animals, for example, come out of a pond and they'll move and then they, and they, and they'll come back to a particular area and disperse for the summer, what have you. And then there's dispersal, which is essentially the, by chance, particularly juveniles dispersing and finding alternate sites that may or may not be optimal, but you know, they may be, and then you establish new uh, breeding sites or wintering sites. And this is a, you know, a reflection of metapopulations where populations can disappear and reform. What uh, we know that, um, this dispersal part, let's say finding new ponds or you can have artificial ponds that are recreated, it, it seems that it, it, we know that there can be olfaction and, uh, and, and magnetic and different orient, celestial different orientations, but what are the cues? There's also the social information side, the calling of courses. There's a lot of in interesting information, but it's very complicated depending on uh, the species, how stable its environment is, and uh, whether it's where, where it utilizes cues. And I think one of the best examples is comparing the great tree frog, which is, tends to be in a more ephemeral, a variable environment, and the Canadian toad, which seems to be in a more permanent, more, more stable environment. Great tree frogs will disperse more and will find new wetlands. They've done experiments and with playback much more, whereas the Canadian toad seems to be reluctant. So to answer your question, I guess over, over periods of time, natural selection takes play in terms of success of a, of a, of a colonizing a particular wintering site and with um, um, homing versus um, not, I'm not sure if that answers your question. 
I think it does. Thanks for that answer. Um, another listener named Sarah is wondering if um, the data that you've collected has been shared with the respective provincial conservation data centers. It will be shortly. This distribution data is being prepared for publication in the Canadian Field Naturalist. And once that's complete and all the, the data proofing, then that will be submitted to the Saskatchewan and Alberta CDCs. Perfect. Thanks for that answer. Um, another listener is wondering if there is a management plan for northern leopard frogs in Saskatchewan or Manitoba. I'm not aware of that. Matt Alberta has one though. Okay. Okay, so you're not aware of one. Thanks for that answer. Um, a listener named Stephen is wondering, have the prairie agricultural practices such as continuous cropping impacted frog and toad populations? Um, do you know of any changes in, in agriculture that's impacted them? I'm not aware of any um, in studies or information that shows a direct linkage to a, um, with uh, empirical data as far as cropping practices such as zero till and, uh, and um, amphibian presence and abundance. I, I gave that example, which is kind of amazing, what of, of, uh, after 100 years in that uh, Maple Creek deleter area, the abundance of calling courses and of, uh, of, uh, of uh, at least of courses in an area highly, very intensively cropped. So they appear to be able to persist on this is one of the problems of just having a presence. We don't, unless you have the uh, trend information in terms of actual numbers and trends and numbers of, uh, of uh, sexually mature adults and, and a successful reproduction, just had be occurring there and persisting does not mean that it's uh, there's not a problem and there's a, undergoing a gradual decline. And we don't mm -hmm. have that kind of information. Yeah, yeah. No, there like is some movie. information from, yeah. No, no, Dr. Christy Morrissey from the University of Saskatchewan and colleagues, for example, have been doing some work on neonicotinoids in terms of effects on wetland um, organisms. So that she would be a good contact to try and look at some of the um, impacts of, uh, in terms of how uh, cropping practices affect the um, breeding locations. Hmm, that's a great idea. Thank you. Um, another listener named Laura uh, says that uh, her family has a cottage on Lake Winnipeg and they used to see lots of northern leopard frogs on their property and nearby streams along the shoreline. Over the years they've seen fewer and fewer and now none at all. Do you have any knowledge or comments on northern leopard frog populations at Lake Winnipeg? I don't have any direct uh, information on Lake Winnipeg. I, I, I just as it with Lake Manitoba and Delta Marsh, there there can be a movement of leopard frogs out of adjacent uh, marshes, wetland into the actual shallow water of the lake, the shoreline for wintering. But as I've mentioned, two things are going on here. Um, you can have they're they're vulnerable to predation by fish. They lay lay in the bottom. They may uh, cover themselves slightly with sediment. Yeah, that they're also subject to ice rafting and scarring at, 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 uh, in the spring. And Lake Winnipeg, this is speculative, but certainly Lake Winnipeg is undergoing a huge uh, biomass challenge with algae and uh, because of the nutrient inputs. Sometimes there's an algae called saprogena, which can affect egg masses, but uh, I'm not sure if it really affects uh, adult frogs or what have you. So. There may be something I can't really uh, I can't really respond to that. I could look into that with colleagues, and if you want to send me an email, I can try and ferret that out for you. Okay, I will um, ask the listener Laura to touch base with you about that for more for more information. Um, yeah, I know hard question. <laughs> Um, there's another listener named Yasmin that's wondering what classes of wetlands do you typically see populations of the northern leopard frog and Great Plains toads? Do you have any information about that? Uh, would this be uh, for, for breeding? Uh, yes, I think so. Yeah. Well, there's two, way, two ways to look at um, wetland class. One is the wetland as a whole, its whole basin, and also you can look at what is the wetland characteristics class on portions of a basin, and in particular its perimeter. 
there's different wetland classifications in the prairie wetlands, Stuart and Cantrude, and there's a very, and um, Jack Millar's uh, classification. There's some others that are used by the Fish and Wildlife Service for water hole surveys. The terms that we use for the primary breeding ponds for uh, Great Plains toads and shallow marshes are seasonal wetlands. And uh, they have some classifications called in Stuart Cantrude type three, but these are seasonal wetlands where water more often than not, depending on the initial runoff and supply and uh, rainfall events, lasts till, till late June, middle of the late June. And this allows for um, development of, uh, of um, the tadpoles. Now from the Northern Leopard Frog, some of these ponds have, have to last into earlier into August. And sometimes that means it's getting into what some wetlands classify as semi-permanent and that water may be maintained into the fall, class four. Okay, thanks for that answer. Um, a listen, listener named Barbara says that there's increased wetland drainage in Saskatchewan. And um, she's wondering is if you know of any data showing the effects of wetland drainage um, on frog and toad population numbers. No, um, I, I have one minor example, but uh, which I'll get to in a moment, but certainly wetland drainage is a big issue. There's promotions uh, for wetland tile drainage, for wetland consolidation. The Wetlands Act and Protection, for example, in Saskatchewan, it doesn't really, it, there's some, some issues with it as far as uh, uh, being able to effectively limit off-farm drainage. So I think in, the, in, in our future, we're gonna have increasing issues as far as losing our wetlands, in the, uh, um, which for a variety of wildlife species, including amphibians. Um, I'll give an interesting example of some wood frog work I've been doing near the Lucky Lake area and uh, southeast of Rose, Rose Town. We mapped out the, what appears to be the main limit range of the wood frog from different uh, surveys. But in subsequent years, I've gone in beyond that, what appears to be the, where they drop off. And, uh, and instead of just doing transects every mile and listening to them, we started visiting every wetland basin we could find for many miles. And here and there, we'd actually find the odd one, there's an upper layer or what have you, sort of near the main drop off of the range. But unfortunately, during these surveys, a large number of them were under onslaught for with scrapers and, and being drained. So uh, certainly um, this is an ongoing issue. Uh, with large equipment, the biggest problem with wetlands is a large equipment of corporate uh, farming. They have very large equipment. They have GPS guidance. So in terms of uh, annoyance and, and uh, they're, they're not interested, uh, some farmers in going around. So certainly the drainage is one means for them to minimize their uh, adjustments during their uh, moving their equipment. So it is an issue. Mm -hmm. I can imagine. Well, I think that's all the time that we have for today. So um, Andy, I just wanted to sincerely thank you for the really interesting presentation. Uh, so detailed and informative and you went back so far, so many years of research that you've shared with us. So thank you very, very much for your time today to, to tell us all about Northern Leopard Frogs and Great Plains Toads. Well, thank you very much and thanks all for coming and everyone take care. And to all of our listeners, thanks for tuning in. Uh, feel free to check out the PCAP website for November's uh, Native Prairie Speaker Series. And we also have a YouTube channel that has a number of past presentations uploaded there too. And when you leave this webinar, you'll receive um, an email survey. It'll just take a quick one minute if you don't mind filling it out. It helps us keep our Native Prairie Speaker Series going into the future. So with that, thank you very much, everyone, and have a great rest of your day.